first day of AU. How many people are here for the first time? Quite a few. That sounds about right. I think back, was it five years ago HSM Works was acquired? And there were Jeff and myself and Anthony Graves that might have joined the live stream walking around and no CAM classes. Autodesk wasn't a part of manufacturing, what we call real, real manufacturing at all. Last year, I think we had rooms that were kind of half full, mostly employees. And we look at the CAM classes for this track and they're all but a few fully booked. Uh, it seems like a couple, over a hundred anyway. Uh, users here to talk about CAM, so it's pretty exciting how many, how many people are here. We've, there's f almost 15 classes, nine classes through the normal track, and then Marty and Tim are doing a full day on, on uh, Thursday. Uh, so it, it should be a good AU for everyone. If you're not aware and you stand up and wave, Justin's also streaming this live. So for the people that are joining live, you'll get the content, but you certainly won't get the experience. Part of what being at AU is is all being together and, and making making connections. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the future of CAM to kick things off. Uh, John Saunders actually had me do a similar talk at his open house. Uh, and the, the very first thing I thought of when I thought the future of CAM is uh, my favorite TV show, The Prophet. I don't know if you've watched The Prophet, um, but he, he comes, it's a reality TV show where he comes in and gets a controlling stake in a business and he focuses on what uh, the three P's, the people, the process, and the product. And that, that to him is what makes a successful business. Most of the time, one of the P's isn't, it's the process, uh, but he focuses on making a business turn around based on the three P's. And when I think of the success of our, our product, I also like to think a lot about the three P's in terms of the product, which obviously you're here to try and see the, the future of the product. I kind of joke and say, well, I'm not really the prophet. I can't see the future, but as a product manager, I should know where the product's going. So we'll look at, uh, we'll look at the future of the product, but, but also the process of how we develop it and how we develop it together and the people that are involved, which is us as developers and you that contribute to making the, making the product. It's part of the process. So we're going to try and hit on, on all three of those things, not just the product because they all, uh, they all come together. Now, anytime you end up with one of these slides, you know you're in a good presentation because we're going to talk about the future and, and sometimes the future changes. But at Autodesk, if you see one of these slides, you me it means you're in a meaty presentation. So that's good, right? Okay, so we're going to look a little bit about uh, how, how I believe the industry is changing in terms of people, process, and product. Uh, I want to introduce you to most of the folks here that are involved in developing it so we can start to create relationships. Again, that's one of the biggest things get from AU. Not saying these classes won't be great, but the chance to talk and make connections is a thing that you definitely shouldn't leave AU without doing. Um, the things stream, there's recordings, you can watch a lot of the content later, but the relationships are very critical when you actually uh, come. We're gonna try and uh, nurture the process of working together. So through the introductions, introduce the, the people on each of the topics that are good to talk to and, and help facilitate that process. And of course, we'll look at our plans for what's happening this quarter, and then some things that are, that are going a little farther out. So in terms of uh, what's happening with the people in the industry, if you came to AU, I think it was three years ago, we got these shirts made, and they're kind of fun shirts to get made. On, on one side, it says all men were created equal, and then few became engineers. And on the other side, it says machinists were created because engineers need heroes too. And I think it's typical of where the industry was. There was a lot of tension between designers and engineers, and we made a little bit of fun of that tension. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, shop guys would get, get a print and say, what was this engineer thinking? I can't make this. And the engineers would say, those grumpy machinists, why don't they just make it? And there's, there's a lot of tension. And what we're seeing now is a lot of this, a lot of the people coming together better. I think it was most highlighted, if you know John Saunders, and he's got a class later, had an open house, and that, that's where it jumped out the most to me, where we're hanging out with, with guys that are engineers and working on supercomputers next to people that are machining their garage and guys that have been running manual machines forever, and everybody was just all kind of together with mutual respect for each other. And I think the industry is, is changing in that way, and there's a lot more mutual respect. Uh, as, as an aside, I kind of blame high school guidance councils, and for a long manufacturing is a dirty trade and convince people not to go into manufacturing and this this kind of changes the people thing a little bit too 
because most of the talent that's coming in, we're seeing now is coming in from the engineering side of the, the house. So I've got two guys that work for me at Pier 9. Uh, one of them's right here, Angelo. Uh, he comes from a, a traditional machining background uh, and is an excellent machinist. The other one, CJ, which I don't think is here, he's probably getting machines set up in the exhibit hall, uh, comes from an engineering background and, and learning machining. And it seems like that's, that's a what's happening. Process, and for this I'll, I'll uh, share a little story uh, that Eric Wilhelm likes to talk about uh, in terms of process. Eric is responsible for all of fusion and he likes to tell the story of this uh, gossamer condor, which incidentally was done in the, the desert just down the hill from where I live. Um, but they were going to claim the, fum the human flight prize uh, and it had gone unclaimed for 30 years. Some teams have been working on the problem for almost 10 years. Uh, two teams, so the, this team in Japan had been working on it for 10 years. Uh, they had the same understanding that to solve this, a human can only put so much power into the plane, so they knew that. Uh, and they knew it was going to be low speed flight, uh, but nobody had ever flown at low speed flight before. And the Japanese team built a, a very nice aircraft out of balsa wood. Um, but of course, nobody had flown at high speed flight, low speed flight before, so they'd go up and they'd crash, and they had to go through the process of rebuilding it. And over the course of 10 years, they only managed to get 10 tests in. So it really stalled their innovation. Uh, on the other hand, these guys down in the desert had the same realization they had to learn how to fly at low speeds, but they built their, they built their plane out of aluminum tubes that they could cut with hacksaws, wire, mylar, and, and tape. So they'd do a test, and they would crash, and they would fix it, and they would do another test sometimes the same day in the course of a year they did 400, 400 flights and they solved the problem. So it, what I'm highlighting here is the process, uh, there's history that shows it, but the process and innovation happens faster when you have a process that allows you to iterate quickly. Uh, so our industry also is going in a direction that allows us to iterate quickly uh, in our process. So that, that's where it leaves us with the tools. We need to build tools that allow the people to stay connected and allows the process to stay connected so you can iterate quickly, whether that's in design and programming, which I think we've done a fairly good job of today with, with Fusion and the HSM products tying design and manufacturing together. Uh, we've introduced our own set of problems doing that, uh, but we've brought the process together on this side of the fence. What you're starting to hear and we'll talk a little bit about today is how do we extend that the whole way through the manufacturing process so that all of the people can be connected and the processes can be connected so we can, we can iterate quickly. So with that in mind, we can, we can jump in and, and start talking about the product. But I think in general, the theme is things are connected. The people are becoming connected. The process is becoming connected. So we have to build a product that's connected. All right, so the people. I apologize for putting all your faces up here if you didn't know I was going to do it, but there's a that I want you to know so that throughout the week you know who to talk to. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, even though it's an hour presentation, it's going to go by very quickly, and I want to make sure that you know who to go talk to about some of the topics we're going to touch on. Uh, so up, up near the top, we've got Jeff sitting at the front here. He leads our development team. Uh, Renee is an architect in the back, a uh, great person to talk to. Peter is... Uh, manages um, many of the developers. Uh, CJ and Angelo are both uh, product managers and work in Pier 9 testing the software, so you'll go find them. Uh, George does a lot of our UX work and a lot of the forward-looking stuff, so when we talk about where we're headed, uh, you want to talk to George and sort of, uh, not solutioning, but let's talk about what your problems are so we can design good solutions for you. Uh, Xander, we like to call the intern, but is doing some exciting work. And then what I've also done is highlighted a bunch of people in blue that have been from the traditional uh, Delcam and NetFab side, but I'm showing that we're we are coming together as one team, and I want you to start to get to know these people too. So I think I see Craig in the room here. Uh, is Tom or Steve here? It uh, doesn't look like, but try and find them too, and let's, let's all talk and start to connect uh, on some of the things we're doing. On the user side of things, again, if you get nothing else at AU and you come back with connections and relationships, that's going to be a great thing to do. So we've got a, a couple users. Rob has got a great class coming up. Uh, John Saunders, you probably know from YouTube. Uh, Lawrence has been quite humble and says he's not really a part of things, but he's been a user that's been influencing our development for far before Autodesk acquired us. Uh, Amish and some of these other guys. There's guys from Datron here. 
Uh, Garen down in the corner is responsible for the manufacturing booth that we have. Uh, there's factory booth downstairs uh, and does a lot of the business development stuff. And these two guys that I have upside down, they're uh, from the other side of the world. Uh, and they're resellers, so they're, they're a little bit of both. But uh, getting to know Scott and get sense. I've got Tim over in the corner here too. So uh, I hope what I'm really trying to highlight is this is the first class in the first day of AU. I'm glad you're able to make it here. And what I want you to take away, if nothing else, is if you're left in a situation where you don't know what class to take, I'd strongly su suggest you take the class where you don't know anybody and get to know more people because you can watch recordings later. But it's harder to build relationships, and when you send an email or on the forum, if you've started to build a relationship, it's going to speed up your process when you're trying to work with them remotely. So uh, please try and take the time to get to know people. And I apologize for the people that are streaming, but that's the bit that you don't get. So classes today. If you wanted to make a speaker, maybe you should bail quickly and go make a speaker, but there's an all-day class today uh, making a speaker, and then that'll be happening live in the three downstairs. Obviously, we're in the uh, future cam class, so you made it to the first class okay. Uh, a couple other classes that might be interested, if you're interested in ECAD and didn't do the whole uh, speaker class, Paul's got a great class, and it's a great way to get to know some of the support folks. Uh, configurable designs and tolerancing, if you're an inventor person, Gavin should go quite well into um, uh, how you can better leverage Inventor to capture manufacturing data. And uh, John Saunders, who I've mentioned a couple times, is doing social media and modern manufacturing. So thinking about how you can promote your business socially, I think would be a great class to, to take. On Wednesday, a couple things to highlight. Uh, if you've been using the software a while, I wouldn't miss Renee's advanced post-processor customization. Uh, everybody, I would highly recommend Rob's class on better tool paths. Uh, he's a master of making the 3D tool paths work well. Uh, works at the Oculus shop with some pretty amazing equipment to prototype stuff, so uh, definitely a good class. There's a nice Fusion Production class that will show you what's going on in Fusion Production, but be a good class to take. Uh, if you're new to CAM completely, Tim and Marty have a starting class. Uh, robotics, Lawrence has been doing some cool things. If you follow him on Instagram, you'll see pictures of him using robots to load his machines, and I think that'll be quite inspirational. Uh, and this last class, uh, I'd highly recommend job shop uh, is uh, working with native fi uh, files that aren't native to Fusion and associativity. So that'd be a good class for anybody that's in a job shop working with external files. Uh, Thursday, there's an all-day class with Tim and Marty uh, that'll go cam from start to finish. They did have some homework, so if you're trying to squeeze in that class or if you are in that class, uh, definitely make sure you got the homework done. If cam's not completely new to you or you didn't do the homework, maybe grab one of the other classes because I think it's well over capacity. Um, so uh, that, that's going to be a great class. Uh, Seth, I think, is in the room here. He's doing a talk on sort of the, the social aspect of running a shop, which again, uh, running a shop is about good parts, but the relationships too, and I think I saw his class last night and it's looking pretty good. Um, if you're in this, just as a side note, if you're in the Thursday class uh, working in Fusion, I think the Wednesday class might be a better fit for the job shops, just, just as an aside. And then our big manufacturing keynote is also on on Thursday, so that's in blue. For some reason, it didn't automatically show up on my schedule, which I thought was weird, so I'm highlighting this one. So that'll be the, the big keynote for everything manufacturing at Autodesk. When Autodesk says manufacturing, we're referring to inventors, so the design and the actual manufacturing side. Okay. Let's get to the meaty stuff. What are we working on? So the first thing I'm going to show you is um, our, our way of how we go about planning. So once a quarter, Jeff and myself and CJ and Angelo and the development leads sit down and say, what is our focus going to be so we can go through and do training with the developers and make sure they understand uh, conceptually sort of the shop side of why we're doing things. And there's, a, there's an idea of where we're focusing our resources. This doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to finish all of this. Some of these things we'll finish. 
Some of these things are going to last more than a quarter, but we like to have the developers know kind of what they're working on for a quarter. Um, so you'll see some collaboration stuff. I'm going to highlight that a little bit later, but we're putting quite a few resources now to making sure we're working together across the manufacturing teams at Autodesk. Uh, probing has been in work, and we're, we're partway through a quarter, so some of you have already seen some of the probing show up in, in HSM works. Uh, for those that have been asking, some tool orientation stuff being added. Uh, the kernel, so that's how the tool paths are calculated. When we think of the software, there's a couple components of it. There's the user experience of how you select geometry, and then there's the underlying tool path kernel that makes the calculation. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of stuff happening on the kernel side. Flow I'll show you about a little bit later. There's a slide for that. I've got a slide for some of the post editors we're working on, so that should be exciting for you. Uh, machine, machine definitions, which is, uh, again, I've got a slide for, but is going to start to introduce the concept of a machine into, into Fusion. Uh, the tool library is something, again, we've, we've got a slide for, but we're focusing on uh, getting things connected together uh, in a better way so we can use the tool library across all of the products, Fusion uh, and HSM works in Inventor HSM. Uh, turning continues to be a place we need to invest resources to get it to the same level of quality that our milling product is, so you should continue to see a bunch of turning things. Um, and then we've got this bucket that we call general quality of life. Uh, we actually spend about 30% of our resources dealing with things like this. So these are the kinds of little things that pop up on the forums and things that make your life better every day. So very easy things for us to do, but they can easily get missed when we're focused on big projects. So we always maintain a set of resources that are working on incrementally using the soft, moving the software forward. So. The list of features the software had is all you need, but it should be getting improved. That's kind of what we call quality of life. Is there any questions on how our process works? No? And we'll have time again at the end of the question, at the end of the session. We do something like this, so this is a sneak peek for everybody here. We do something like this once a quarter, and we spend what we call a customer advisory board and dive into this a lot deeper. So there's a couple guys represented here on the customer advisory board. Uh, Rob is on the customer advisory board for Cam. Seth is, Lawrence is. Uh, I think there's a couple more guys that are part of that customer advisory board. So uh, if you want to be a part of it, then reach out. But we, we like to uh, get a little deeper uh, with a few more of those uh, slides that say we're going to talk about things that not everybody gets to see. Uh, with customers and, and double check that we're doing the right things. Okay. Let's start. Let's start looking through some some of the some of the work. So flow um, is already starting to show up in beta in some of the software. Uh, flow is a tool path that aligns itself to the ISO curves of of a surface. So it's a good a good tool path to use when you're going along an external radius. Uh, what it does well is it doesn't really matter if it's in a steep area or a shallow area because it's evenly grade, laying the tool path across the surface. Whereas uh, a lot of the tool paths are what we would call a projection tool path. It's sort of looking down from the top and, and projecting. So a parallel tool path, for example, does super good on a flat area and then it gets to something real steep and the next step over means that there was, there was a huge step over along the surface. Uh, so then you could Combine that with something like a contour tool path that does very, very well in the steep areas, but has the inverse problem in a shallow area, where a tool path like Flow will have an even step over across a surface. It also makes it a very good tool path for when you're doing any multi-axis work. So, so you'll start to be able to do uh, multi-axis machining with it. The thing that makes Flow not quite as good is it does require it to be aligned with the ISO curves, and you end up creating these arrows that say I want it to go this way along the surface and this way along the surface and this way along the surface. So it's a little bit more user intensive, but it's a very powerful tool path when you know exactly what you want it to do. Uh, and if you're interested in how you drive tool paths, again, Rob's class would be an excellent class to go to uh, because you'll be surrounded by a bunch of other people that are also interested and Rob will talk a lot about uh, how, um, how you use it. This is one that Tim, incidentally, uh, always complains about us not having uh, in Inventor HSM and in Fusion. We've had it in HSM works for a while, uh, so you can see kind of the reason it wasn't there is it, it uses a lot of CAD information uh, to do it. So it was different work than the other 3D tool paths, but hopefully you find that one very useful. 
So the, the next tool path that works in a, in a very similar way and it will be useful in very similar situations is blend. And if you looked at something that was just a single external ra radius, you would get a tool path that is, that is very, very similar to flow. The difference is uh, with blend, you pick any surfaces that you want and there can be gaps in it. So you're seeing multiple patches of surfaces where in flow you'd have to try and align it to the ISO curves of the surface. Uh, blend uses rails to say, okay, this is the surface I wanna fill and the rail is going to uh, work across it. So you can think of it like a, a morph tool path combined with a scallop tool path. So a morph is a projection tool path if you didn't know. So it, it does the morph looking from the top and projecting down, but it has a similar issue to parallel, whereas when it starts to go down a steep area, it doesn't have a consistent surface finish along it. Um, fl flow, or, uh, flow and uh, uh, will allow you to have a consistent surface finish. And this incidentally will be the tool paths you start to use a lot when you do uh, multi-axis. So it does support uh, the multi-axis functionality. And again, Rob's class would be a good one to go to. It's been in beta for a little while. Rob's been using it quite a bit. Uh, if you hear me talking about beta and you wonder how you get it, uh, you can enable beta in any of the builds of our software and, and talk to any one, of the, any one of these faces up here that work for Autodesk and we can help you figure that out. Okay, machine configurations is probably one of the bigger projects that we're working on this quarter that's sort of architecturally gonna help us change where the, where the software is going and how it's used. I didn't put an arrow to, to Peter, but Peter would be a good person to talk to about this. George would be another good person to talk to about this. And Renee, who works on the post, would be another good person to talk to about this. Because um, the machine configurations are at this interesting crossroads where they influence uh, what the post processor does. Uh, so if you've asked or sat, help people say, well, how do I enable four axis in my post? And today you have to go into the post and set a zero to a one. Uh, these are sorts of things that you can enable in the, in the machine configuration. Say I've got a, an A-axis that rotates around uh, the X-axis. It, it also can start to let us indicate things in the software that says you're asking me to tilt to an angle that your machine doesn't support. So it's at this interesting crossroads between uh, the outputted code and what's going on in the software. The first iterations of it will kind of just focus on uh, some of the more basic metadata You'll see a, a machine node show up in the browser that lives somewhere above a setup, um, but architecturally, uh, you should expect to see this become a more and more critical part of how you use the software. Uh, so please, if you've got any thoughts around how we can better leverage information about the machine or uh, things you think we should be doing or just questions about what we're working on in this regards, uh, George is a great person to talk to, and again, uh, Renee or, or Peter. Or, or find one of the power users like Rob or Lawrence. Uh, any one of those faces I put up would be good people to talk to on that. Uh, post customizer, is Xander not here? Xander's not here. So we've had uh, a couple guys working on this project. Xander's working on the user experience, but there's two things happening on the post uh, customization side. On, on the uh, colorful side here, you're seeing a, a browser-based editor. If you find Xander in the answer bar, uh, he'll show you, it's, it's live and working right now. Uh, but this will allow you to drag blocks around and drag sections around so you can say that I want this to be in my header, a G0 or a custom uh, GRM code. Uh, when you select a code, you'll see that you're selecting all of the codes and some properties along uh, the side here that allow you to say how many zeros do I want and these sorts of things. So the the goal here is to support uh, three through five axis machines when it's released. Uh, we'll have sample posts built on it so you can take a look at a Haas post and say I really wanted this to happen on this line and wanted my coolant to turn on here. This is the problem we're trying to solve is a lot of the, a lot of the cosmetic type edits that happen in post processors. I say cosmetic because the machine works fine but operators are used to seeing this code on this line. Nice video make those sorts of changes uh, as a user. On the other side, um, anybody that's part of the HSM forum, and I think Lawrence has already downloaded this, uh, George Roberts has been working on an advanced editor that uses a CPS file uh, and allows you to, 
sort of streamline that workflow. So in his advanced editor, select outputted code, and that'll correspond with the JavaScript that produced that code. What I want to make sure everybody's aware of is with this quote unquote simplified editor, it's not a new post system or not a new post engine. It's a user experience that's layered on top of the same a JavaScript engine. So uh, you can continue to use any of the existing posts. There'll be some of these new user editable posts that you can edit with, with, this, with this GUI based system. Uh, so again, if, if there's a lot of posts that you're having, to do, a lot of edits you're having to do on a regular basis that you don't think should take the, the full control and flexibility of getting right into the JavaScript, find Renee or find Xander and let's talk about strategically what, what bucket they land in. Because it may be that the edit you're talking about is something that is a parameter uh, that we should bake in with the JavaScript logic and it's a machine parameter that says, well, I just want to turn on the fact that I've got a side mount tool change or something like that. And that is logic that we would build into a stock post uh, or it may be a cosmetic edit that we should make easy for users to change. Um, so this is, this is quite exciting. Hopefully that's helpful for you, Seth, so you can answer post questions and you can answer more machining questions. Uh, Seth, I don't know, I called him out a couple times, but Seth is on the forum all the time, so another good person to, to get to know. Okay, uh, and I mentioned uh, Renee is doing an advanced post-processor customization class. I sh should probably ad emphasize the advanced part of it, uh, so guys like Lauren and Rob shouldn't miss it. If you've never edited a post before, you're probably better off spending some time in the answer bar with Xander. Not saying don't go to the class, but uh, it will be a fairly advanced <coughs> class. A tool library, a bunch of work is going on. I gave uh, Jeff this little hero status uh, thing for, for finally integrating some of the UX stuff we had in the desktop based library. Uh, the first time I used HSM works, I was coming from another CAM system and my first experience was seeing the tool library and that was sort of the aha moment where I thought these guys really care about the user experience. And it was a little bit of, of code that was actually fairly difficult. It seemed like it would, it would be uh, easy to just have some graphics and lay some dimensions next to it. Um, but it turns out that it was uh, a little more difficult, so it laid in the background for a long time. Uh, but thankfully, we have a development lead that's, and he's literally got his sleeves rolled up, uh, uh, is willing to roll up his sleeves and, and help us work stuff out. Uh, so you'll, you should be excited to see some of this graphic stuff show up in the Fusion library and should get us a lot closer to making sure that you don't uh, have disgust when we introduce this one library across all of the products. So hopefully by the end of the quarter, we start giving an option to use either the Fusion library or the existing desktop library in all of the desktop products. Uh, so for the Inventor HSM users and ideally next quarter as provided all things, it'll switch from an option to being the, the primary experience. So please, 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 if there's things in the tool library that are showstoppers for you in terms of what the desktop solution does and what the current Fusion solution does, uh, now's a good time to bring it up. Uh, talk to George about it, talk to Peter about it, talk to Jeff about it. Find any one of us and, and share your thoughts or concerns. Okay, uh, turning. Uh, continue to do a lot of work. Uh, Lawrence is doing a good multitasking class that'll, that'll have some turning stuff. There's a turning component to the, the class Tim is doing too, so those would be great times to to dive deeper into turning, uh, but lots of work is happening on, on turning. Lawrence is probably the user here that's doing the most turning. If Lonnie was here, I'd have you talk to, to Lonnie, uh, who's a great user using turning. Um, some of the users are critical, and we like that. So Lonnie's, Lonnie's very critical uh, on us, uh, but he also loves the software. And I bring that up because I want all of you guys to not be afraid of being critical. We'll, we'll do our best to be honest with you why something's the way it is, but the most important thing is we have an open dialogue. Uh, so PEC turning's been added. What PEC turning will do is if you've ever cut nylon or anything like that, I remember having to cut it when early on in my apprenticeship and it just strings itself back around the part. Uh, so PEC turning will allow it to, to cut and just back off a little bit or pause for a second and break the stringy chip and then uh, keep going along. So it's going to allow you to 
add some stops along the, the way. This is incidentally is part of uh, the balance between supporting CAN cycles, which incidentally we are working on too, uh, but it goes in contrast to something like CAN cycles when you introduce stuff like this that a CAN cycle just doesn't support. Uh, in there, uh, non-ISO tools, I specifically called it as non-ISO tools because a lot of the times we get requests for uh, custom turning tools and there's a difference. A non-ISO tool is the same basic geometry as what an ISO tool was, but allows you to enter your own dimensions. When we talk about a true custom tool, it would be I wanna draw a shape and use that to plunge into something. Uh, we're not doing the, the true custom tool profiles yet. When we do do it just as a sort of an FYI, it will most likely just be for doing things like, like plunging in and uh, it, it wouldn't support a, a roughing tool path, for example. Uh, but this will allow you to sort of set custom dimensions for, a, for an insert, something that's a similar shape to an insert. So a line and an arc and a line, what's the angle between the lines, what's the radius on the end of it? Uh, that's in there now. And then Sandvik Prime Tooling. Uh, some of the users are already getting access to the beta versions of this, uh, but Sandvik has done some, some pretty cool tool, tooling that needs an interesting lead in and then it cuts uh, across, uh, across the part. Some of the people were asking why it doesn't go both ways. Um, so incidentally, again, the, the concept of this is it's back turning, it's going backwards. We didn't call it Sandvik Prime turning in the software, you'll look for a back turning option. But it's gonna have a, a lead in and it's gonna drag backwards across the, across the part. Okay. So now we get to look forward a little bit more. We'll spend a few minutes looking at this and my, my hope is that we have a good 15 minutes at the end to, to discuss some of the concepts, that whichever, whichever concepts you guys wanna talk about uh, the most. So first and foremost, this is gonna be, uh, a I just wanna sort of set the stage for what's in the back of our minds so we can inspire some discussion. Um, but really what we're thinking about here and what we wanna have a conversation about is what process do you go through for managing the manufacturing steps? Today, there's a general feeling that the design tools are very design centric. You end up with a 3D model, but then when we get to actually manufacture it, it goes through multiple manufacturing steps that are executed on with machining setups or maybe a manual saw cut off or a water jet cut. So a lot of times we sort of hack our way around it by having multiple solid bodies and that sort of thing. But we want, we, what we want to try and do is have a conversation around what are your manufacturing steps and what tools do you need to be able to use when you're in those manufacturing steps. Do you need to be able to do modeling? Uh, what kind of documentation processes are get you going through and what would you expect a tool to be able to do? Um, so I could easily see everyone in this room having a one hour one on one conversation with George. Um, so if that were to happen, feel free to find one of the rest of us, but we really want to understand your problems in man managing the process so that we can effectively build a tool that thinks about manufacturing and is not just design centric. Does that make sense? Am I right in assuming this is a fundamental problem with the way the tools work today? So th this is kind of what, um, kind of what I was saying at the beginning when I said we did a good job connecting, connecting the tools together and I would tell a joke that's as much of a joke on us as it is on a standalone so solution, but I, I'd, maybe you'd heard me say, what's the difference between a standalone and integrated CAM system? And you'd sort of say, well, one has better CAD because it's inside of a CAD system. But the reality is that inherently introduced its own set of problems because it also dirtied the, the CAD process. It's sitting on top of the manufacturing data where a standalone so solution does a very good job separating the manufacturing information from the design information. So we, we solved one problem and created another. And what we're looking to do now is say, how do we solve both problems? Both have a segregation of process, which if a standalone solution is done through file formats, and also have the tools together so you have access to the power of the modeling tools and the power of the, the manufacturing tools. So that's, that's the discussion that we want to inspire. And that's kind of why we're talking about this on the first day, so you have three days to find some of us and talk through your thoughts on it. Again, any one of these things could easily be an hour-long presentation. Now, fusion production, 
I think Rob, are you part of the, the beta? Is anybody else part of this beta? A couple, good. Oh, Dr. Phil's here too. You gotta follow Dr. Phil on Instagram. Um, so fusion production is, is again talking about moving beyond the wall of, okay, now I, so it used to be I designed this, it's going over the fence to the cam guy and he does his thing and then it's going over the fence and it's turning into paper travelers and the manufacturing guys are gonna make it and there's these walls, the processes weren't connected. So fusion production is looking at how do we connect these processes together and track what's happening on the shop floor. Today, I'd, I'd, anytime, I'd think of it as any time you see a shop traveler, a, a piece of paper with a list of steps that have to happen on something, uh, that's a good use case for fusion production where we're trying to capture the manufacturing process. Again, if we've digitized the whole thing, we can start to think about a process where like that, uh, that human powered flight, they could iterate at any point. If they crashed in the, on the runway, they could tape it right then and there and fix the problem uh, because they had a tool that they could use throughout the process. And this again is talking about having a tool that works the whole way through the manufacturing process. Rob Melly, I don't, is Rob in the room? Rob's not in the room, but Rob is the, is the right guy to find. Uh, Wednesday at one, uh, he'll be doing a one hour class on fusion production. I would expect it to be a very similar format to this where he shows what's going on and there's a, there's a chance for a dialogue. So uh, if you feel like your process in your shop is, is dated or you've got a lot of shop travelers running around on magnets stuck to pallets, uh, definitely go to Rob. Uh, they, they listen a lot. I connected him with uh, Jay Pearson, who we all, most of the HSM guys know. Uh, they had an interview with Jay Pearson on what was wrong, and the latest release I saw a bunch of Jay's requests show up in the software. So they're, they're definitely listening. You want to make connections so they listen to you too. Um, so I picked a couple little things to, to highlight, but really what I want to highlight here is we really are aggressively looking for how we can work together better with uh, the teams that I would call the former, the former Dell Cam team. So one of the, the internal, I'll call it, today I'll call it an internal experiment. So this is why I showed you the slide at the beginning, uh, but it's showing sort of our thought and thinking. Uh, we have internally working an ability to pass neutral toolpath data back and forth between tools. But again, we feel that we should connect the process, but when you need to use a tool that has more capability, you should be able to easily take your work between our tools. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a toolpath that was calculated in Fusion and brought in as a neutral toolpath into Power Mill where you could start adding uh, more toolpath to it. So you'll see us doing things like that, uh, things like uh, starting to share our resources on the kernel teams. Um, so there's one example of spun profile in, in HSM that's not as stable as it should be and that's, that's an area we're working together and then inversely for the, the people that come from the Delcam group, you'll see Delcam getting adaptive clearing. So we're really trying to work a lot closer together. Um, I put this slide up, uh, A, so that if you know nothing about power mill or the power of it, you should absolutely uh, take the, the class there. It might not come to you, come across as a power mill class, but I think it's the best one to go and, and talk to some of the power mill experts and you're teaching a class, right? Uh, so this, this row of people would be a good group of people to go to if you wanna hear sort of more about what's going on on that side. And again, inspiring this discussion of how you think we should be working better together. Uh, Craig, if you can throw your hand up, is my equivalent on the power mill side. So he's the product manager for power mill, so again, so a good person to get to know and have a conversation with. And Tom's not here, but Tom leads the product management team uh, for that group. So some additive stuff, uh, you'll hear a lot more about this. I felt okay showing it because it was shown at D, uh, D3D, um, but you may or may not be aware Autodesk acquired a fab that's very strong in additive, uh, additive manufacturing. So we're starting to look at how we introduce the additive workflows into Fusion uh, in a way that will support uh, hybrid workflows. So you should be able to do additive work and subtractive work together. But this really pushes us down the direction that we can't get away with not solving this data problem of how you capture, how you bring manufacturing processes together. It's just, it's not possible to solve it well without thinking about capturing the the steps that a manufacturing process goes through. 
Uh, so great people to talk to on this. Alessandro is doing a, a class that will focus on NetFab, but it'll introduce you to what the technology is capable of and a person to get to know on the product management side. Uh, George is doing our, our UX research and work and how we should be tying these things together. Uh, or catch Jeff or I with any thoughts on how you think it, how you think it should go together. But we have access to all this additive technology. We believe it needs to come together, but I think you're starting to see the need for why we need to process well uh, and make sure we're extending the tools. Uh, this incidentally, when you think about well, why does machine configurations become so important? Well, it's a critical aspect to, to additive too. So maybe I'm trying to show a little bit about how some of the thought process works in product management. Why are you focusing on this now? Well, this is a problem that needs to be solved because there's a couple aspects to it. Um, but this is another great thing to find some people to, uh, to talk about. A little earlier in the process, but uh, George has also started working uh, and thinking about how we, how we leverage the nesting technology that we have. Uh, so you can find Matt slip in. Matt is sitting over here. Matt Wynn is on the, uh, the former Majestic team that brings a lot of the nesting technology to auto the process of thinking about how, how nesting also becomes a part of uh, the digital manufacturing tools that are inside of Fusion. And again, this highlights the need and what I want to inspire the discussion around, how do we manage the data? Because you have a lot of processes that converge and diverge apart, right? You nest some things together to, to cut them out and blank them out, off to another manufacturing step where they happen independently, and then maybe you batch them back together to machine a bunch of holes in them. Uh, but it really, really becomes important that we start to track the steps that this thing goes together, how it breaks apart and comes back together. So uh, again, we're not looking for solutions, but we're looking to have good conversations over the course of the week and build connections so that uh, we're building a solution that makes sense for, for what you need. Okay. So where... Uh, where can you find us throughout the, throughout the week? Um, after the general session, uh, the exhibit hall will open up. Today is the day it's open the longest. It's going to be open from noon till 9. So if you're mentally exhausted and taking too many classes, you could slip down to the exhibit hall during, uh, during classes. Uh, but it'll be open from, from noon after after all the way through until 9, so we'll have lunch and dinner in the exhibit hall. Uh, two places where you'll most likely find us. Uh, you'll find us in this uh, factory zone at the very end. It's probably going to be uh, most obvious to you when you see the big Haas machines, but other than Haas, there's printer bots in there. There's a, an Omax water jet cutter that's literally uh, 40 inches wide, so it could nicely slide into a garage or something. Uh, 30,000 PSI, by the way, so it's very powerful, too. Um, but there's an OMAX there. Datron's got a machine. Uh, if you haven't used a Datron or experienced how you control a Datron with the touch screen, uh, go talk to Chris from Datron. It's pretty exciting to probe a circle. For example, you draw a circle around the part, and the camera sees the part, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to probe it. So I highly suggest going and talking and let you interact with that machine. Uh, Proto Labs did some 3D, some uh, molds of, of the speaker, because the speaker will be being made there. Uh, Universal Laser Systems has, has their laser there uh, that you can take a look at. CNC Router Parts has, has a very nice, uh, quite rigid uh, router. So take a look at it and maybe try and get the CFO to uh, let you get one for your garage. I certainly know it goes through my mind. Uh, Pocket NC has as a machine, I, I love the Pocket NC story because they design it and inventor, they machine it and inventor HSM, and then they control it with uh, Fusion or inventor HSM. Uh, so it's kind of the full circle, but they've got a desktop five axis machine that's less than $5,000. It's pretty impressive. Uh, and then Tormach has gotten so big, they've got their own booth across the aisle. So uh, some, some great machines to see and a great place to find us. Uh, the answer bar, if you're interested in that post-processor stuff, uh, there and you'll find Xander there working the answer bar for most of the week. But those would be the two places to go and try and find us. Uh, if you don't find us there, most of us are all over Instagram. 
Uh, so if you, if you add any one of us, you'll start to see things that tag the rest of us. Um, but there's a lot of us that are on Instagram and a great place to, to connect with us throughout the week. We're, we're all pretty active there. It seems like it's the place for machinists. So it's, it's how I found Jeremy, who's a 17-year-old student that is doing some pretty crazy parts for, uh, for race cars. So anyway, find us on, find us on Instagram. So with that, um, we can kind of start a discussion on any one of the things you want. 15 minutes exactly, so I guess I timed it right. Um, the big, again, the biggest thing I want to bring out, if a lot of people put their hands up as being their first time to AU, my guess is by the end of today, you're going to start to feel mentally exhausted and by you might not remember uh, anything you took. The good news is most of these things are recorded. Some of these streamed ones will be will be live right away. Um, but the relationships you build will be the most important things that you take away with because you can start to have conversations with us on social, over email, on the forums. Uh, that, that to me is the most important thing of being here in person. The classes are obviously very valuable too, but I can't encourage you enough to, to spend some of the time making the connections in how we build the product. We truly believe in those three Ps. There's the product but how we're connected together and all of the people that are part of that conversation is all equally important. So we need, to, we need to expand the group of people that are building this. The last thing you want is a CAM system that's the CAM system I want or the CAM system Jeff wants or the CAM system that, that Tim wants. It might not be so bad. Well, I mean, if it's the one I want, then it'll be good. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, see, everybody's got a, a way of doing it and they're all right, right? The, the fun thing as a product manager is trying to listen to all of the voices and, and find the solution that's study and that's, that's best done with a, a better perspective. So just as a, as a side story and the perspective thing, um, I was told once by an optometrist that people whose eyes are far apart have better spatial perception because you have a, a better view on the sort of the two views that you're looking at. But I always think about that when I think of having a good perspective. The, the wider your, the difference between the views you have, the, the better perspective you have of the problem. So, so please be a part of the conversation. So that, is there any of the slides you want to dive into a little bit more? It is a definitely good opportunity for. Okay, so the so the question the question was, um, there's all kinds of people doing all kinds of tool paths. Uh, is Autodesk eventually going to use machine learning to come up with a better solution for it? Um, absolutely. I think there's some incremental steps that we could make that would have a advantage. Uh, speeds and feeds is the one that jumps to me immediately. We've talked to this about with the customer advisory board. Uh, it's one that's probably the easiest one to solve and will have the biggest impact. Uh, today, we've got a, a more fundamental problem. Each tool inside of the product only has a single speed and feed. So we, we need to solve the issue of saying, based on these cutting conditions, I'm roughing with this half inch end mill in aluminum. Uh, this is the speed need to step over in the step. So first of all, we need to solve the problem of allowing you to, to log more than one set of cutting parameters per tool geometry. And then it seems very obvious that you could start to use uh, machine learning to say, well, the last time I was doing this on that machine, uh, this is what happened. Uh, so that, that would help it and, and fill in the dots. That also comes back into this, this whole idea of why connecting the whole process matters because I, I don't know how many people spent time on the shop floor, uh, but it doesn't matter what the CNC programmer does, you've got that same conflict between the CNC programmer and the operator. That dumb operator doesn't, programmer doesn't know what he's doing. I'm going to adjust the speeds and feeds on this machine. And then you don't really know what happened on the shop floor, so whatever you had in your CAM system is useless anyway. So a big part of that is connecting the whole process so we know what actually happened on the shop floor and we can use that intelligence uh, to leverage it later. But speeds and feeds, I think, is the, the most obvious one. And 
from there, there's probably more complicated problems we can solve. So I'm smiling because hearing these problems is a good thing. It means that people aren't, and you're a Fusion user, it means that people aren't using Fusion to do two 2D profiles and make something on their toy router. You're, you're doing real work with it, so this is a good problem to have. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple things. One of the obvious things is creating folders and just organizing your stuff, but probably the larger problem is when you're 200 operations in, you don't really want to do a stock simulation of the first 199 to focus on what you're doing on the last one. So this, again, ties into capturing the manufacturing process. This is a more on a micro level, so not between physical manufacturing steps, but just steps within your manufacturing process to kind of help you through it. So there's that aspect of it, and then there's the, the changing aspect of it. We've done a little bit with compare and edit, but I think there's more that there too. If there's thoughts, Talk to George, talk to Renee, share, share notes with Lawrence and Rob and Dr. Phil and come back to us and let us know your thoughts. But it's definitely one of those things that ties into a bunch of pieces. Exactly. So for the users that aren't using HSM a lot, the, each tool has a static speed and feed. So if you want to use your half-inch ML to rough and finish, there's two instances of it to capture the time you use that physical tool to rough and the time you used it to, to finish. And the, and the other thing is when you've got that many operations, you're starting to manage how many tools can I actually use based on the size of my carousel. There's a lot of thinking and planning that goes into it that, again, ties back to machine configurations and some of these architectural steps we have to take so we can get to where we need to get. And when you break into a separate file, this, this is the conversation to have about stages. I, I machined four of them together. I took it to a bandsaw and cut it apart. H how do we track that process? And what do you want to do if you change the first step? How does that, how does that sort of tie together? So. You can easily see this, that could have, we debated that conver that being a one hour presentation, sort of thought that yeah. the best thing to do for this hour was to inspire discussion. So, but that could have easily been an hour. Anything else? Justin, has anybody got questions online? Well, if anybody else has questions online, feel free and Justin will ask. Yes, it will definitely be an inventor. The thing that's holding it up is, is this tool library thing. Uh, we, we added the water, laser, and plasma tools to Fusion, and it's an integral part of the workflow for how it's used. You select a, a laser-type tool or a plasma-type tool. Uh, we've chosen not to put those tools into the old desktop library, but instead introduce that technology when, when we have the, the Fusion library. But the other aspects of it are, are incidentally there now. There's a lot of shared code between the two. It's very easy for us to turn that spot on. The only real holdup right now is having the right tool support. So if all goes as planned, and again, I can't make promises, but uh, if we had the same conversation next year, something's drastically wrong, um, I'd expect it sooner rather than later. Wire EDM was something that we avoided putting a lot of effort into because there was a lot of more important things for our mainstream solutions. It becomes a more interesting conversation, A, now that we have the, the profiling stuff because there's a quite close parallel to the needs there, and then B, when you start thinking about hybrid processes for additive printing wire, 
incidentally become super important for how you cut the supports off. So I could see it becoming a priority. Up until now, it, hasn't, it honestly hasn't been a priority, and there's been enough other things higher on the priority list. That's another good example if we can work through, uh, and as we work through working together with the larger Autodesk CAM group, then you'll see some of those things could be accelerated. But it hasn't been a priority till now. It, it's becoming more of a priority. But it's, it's not something being actively developed yet. Machine simulation. So this is, uh, would be a step that comes after machine configurations. We have to get that done first. Um, and then we'll start talking about machine simulation. It's incidentally a, an issue that the power mill team is also working through. So my definite hope is that we don't go and solve the, the problem independently, but we, we work together on it. It's certainly something the more people are doing five axis, the more important it is. So uh, Phil and Rob and some of the guys that are pushing the limits a little bit more on five axis now would be a week to find me or find, find Craig, any one of us, to talk about sort of needs on that front. It is equally, it's a different simulation problem, but equally if not more important. Feel free to share. Yeah. So that's a that's the thing you guys are most most worried about is machine simulation. Lawrence brings up a good point. There's two aspects to machine simulation. A lot of the time it's, it's blurred. So there's a lot of solutions like Vericut. And then if you don't know, we do have a good connection to products like that and Camplete uh, that do machine simulation and are also what I would call third party validation. They're looking at the code that we output and, and simulating it. So it's like getting mom to check your homework before you pass it in. Uh, there's the other aspect of us, us, what we believe, whether we do it before or after we, we post the code, it's still based on us checking our own homework. Um, so there's an aspect of simulating the code that we produced and what we think it's going to do. And then there's a, there's a simulation aspect of part of my ISO standard is I get third party validation. And by definition, third party validation is a third party doing it. So there are kind of two aspects to it. Does that make sense? But yes, we need to show you sort of what the physical machine is doing so you can better make decisions. How are we on time? Oh, look at that, two minutes. Time for one more question. Are the online guys gonna take it since they don't get to talk all week? No? Good. Okay class before the general session. If you haven't been to AU before, it starts to become a madhouse probably by about 10 o'clock with everybody piling in trying to get front row seats at the general session. Uh, that's going to happen downstairs. So if you know where the exhibit hall is, just before the doors to the exhibit hall is where everybody piles up like it's a new iPhone coming out, uh, getting ready to go in and find their seats. If you find any of us, then we can sort of be a force of numbers and try and find a seat together. We usually like to get the cam guys sitting together. You don't have to, but if you find us, let's build our own mob and, and find a place to sit. And I look forward to chatting all throughout the week. Thank you.
Uh, hopefully some people come find you and talk to you.